Welcome to the Central Association webinar. Um, now it gives me really great pleasure um, to introduce. Uh, so Cassandra, um, I say from the University of Illinois, and uh, she's going to speak to us tonight on the bee's microbiome and how it is useful uh, in nest mate recognition. So thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to share some of my research on the role of microbiome in nest mate recognition in the honeybee. Uh, before I get into this work, however, I wanted to give a background on the type of research that I'm interested in. So overall, I'm interested in understanding complex behaviors of social insects. I was introduced to this topic as an undergraduate at the University of Michigan when I worked in the lab of Elizabeth Tibbetts. This lab studies social signaling in Polistes paper wasps. So in Polistes paper wasps, they use markings on their face to signal different um, information to each other. Here I'm depicting two different species of Polistes. The top is Polistes fuscatus and the bottom are images of Polistes dominula. In Polistes fuscatus, every individual has a different facial marking and they use this in individual recognition. Um, similar to how we as humans recognize each other by our, by our facial features, these, uh, this wasp species does the same. Similarly, in uh, Polistes dominula, uh, they also have distinct uh, facial markings, but rather than individual recognition, they use these to signal fighting ability and um, social status. So individuals that have uh, more black pigment on their face um, are known to be stronger, and they can actually use this to uh, look at an individual, determine if they want to fight that individual over something like territory or um, reproductive rights. And so working in that lab really got me interested in social insects. I had no idea that there were, that insects had the ability to do these types of behaviors. And so I wish to continue learning about social insects by studying the honeybee. Um, so as a graduate student at the at Washington University in St. Louis in Yehuda Benchahar's lab, and now currently as a postdoc in Gene Robinson's lab at the University of Illinois, I am studying the role of gut microbiome in honeybee behavior. So the work I'm presenting today is from a recent publication um, that was a collaboration between uh, researchers at Washington University in St. Louis and researchers at University, University of Toronto at Mississauga. And this uh, paper should be open access, so you should be able to download it if you wish. Okay, so um, before I get into the paper, however, I wanted to go over some background information about microbiomes and their role and behavior, um, as well as what nest mate recognition is. And then I will get into the hypothesis and data and results of the paper. And finally, I'll finish up by going over some current work that I'm working on in the Robinson lab. So let's jump in. So a microbiome is a collection of bacteria, fungi, and other microbes that live in a common environment. This environment can be abiotic, such as soil or water, and it can also be biotic. Um, for example, on plants, microbes live on the leaves and, and in the um, roots. And on, in animals, microbes live both in and on the bodies of um, these organisms. For example, in humans, microbial cells actually outnumber human cells 10 to 1, and distinct microbiomes are found on different parts of our bodies. For example, we have a distinct microbiome on our skin, a distinct microbiome in our nose and our mouth, and a distinct microbiome in our guts. And the majority of microbes are actually found in animal guts, and this is the case across um, all animals. For decades, gut microbiomes have been known to function in health-related aspects of their hosts, including roles in digestion, nutrition, and immune function. For example, in mammals, microbiomes are known to play a role in immune system development they help prevent pathogen invasion and disruption 
enrichment of their micro microbiome results in autoimmune diseases and other dis disorders such as irritable bowel syndrome and Crohn's disease. In the honeybee alone, certain components of the microbiome are known to be involved in priming the immune system against future pathogens, metabolizing sugars that honeybees cannot digest themselves. This includes uh, mannose, arabinose, xylose, and rhamnose, which are all found in natural nectar. Um, some of the components of the honeybee microbiome actually acidify the gut um, to limit invasion by pathogens that cannot live in um, acidic environments. All of the microbes in the gut help promote weight gain in honeybees, and all of them also um, play a role in immune signaling. And this work um, is actually largely um, done, or this information was largely found out through work in, by Nancy Moran in her lab at the University of Texas. Um, and further work by the Moran group um, indicates that exposure to stressors such as antibiotics and herbicides can actually alter the microbiome and have downstream effects on honeybee mortality and survival. A big factor here is that the microbiome basically protects the bee from pathogens. Um, and therefore, when you disrupt it through using antibiotics or um, herbicides such as glyphosate, which is the main component in Roundup, uh, this leads to decreased survival in honeybees. So in addition to health-related effects on the host, microbiomes have recently been found to influence behaviors of their hosts. So about a decade ago, the gut microbiome was shown to, to interact with the central nervous system to affect brain physiology and behavior. This work highlights a really important role of the microbiome in, man, in maintaining host behavioral phenotypes. For example, um, in mammals, the gut microbiome has been um, implicated in uh, neural development, playing a role in anxiety and depression behaviors, and even plays a role in defining social interactions between conspecific individuals. In insects, the microbiome is known to play a role in uh, locomotive behaviors, learning and memory, and communication. And so my research overall focuses on understanding how the gut microbiome influences behaviors of the honeybee. Um, this slide depicts some of those behaviors that I'm interested in. We have um, nest mate recognition, the transition from nursing behaviors to foraging behaviors, and overall just interactions between bees such as trophallaxis or food sharing. Um, and so this paper focuses on nest mate, recogni nest mate recognition. So I'm going to briefly go over what nest mate recognition is and what are the cues that are used in nest mate recognition. So nest mate recognition is a trait that has evolved across eusocial insects as a way to protect stored food, brood, and other colony resources. It occurs at the entrance to the colony where guarding individuals use cues on incoming individuals to determine if they are a nest mate or an intruder. So here I'm depicting um, guards at the entrance of um, a honeybee colony, a stingless bee colony, an acacia ant colony, and an aerial yellow jacket colony. And so the cues that, um, that are used in nest mate recognition are colony specific, meaning that individuals from the same colony have a similar cue and those of a different colony have a different cue. And in most cases, they're composed of, a chemi of chemical compounds. In most cases, this is a blend of cuticular hydrocarbons or CHCs. So what are CHCs? Well, these are, are um, long waxy compounds that coat the entire um, insect body. Now the exoskeleton of an insect is called a cuticle. So I'll probably refer to that quite a lot throughout the um, talk, um, but the cuticle is just the entire um, external part of the insect body. And since uh, CHCs are waxy, they uh, keep the insect from drying out. Now, CHCs uh, are produced in specialized cells in the abdomen of the insect. Um, so this is just a depiction of where the enocytes are located. So this um, is a cross section of the, uh, the cuticle of a honeybee. This top part is uh, the outside of the honeybee and down here is the 
internal part of the honeybee and the enocytes are found directly beneath the cuticle and these produce those uh, long chain waxy compounds which are then shuttled to the surface of the insect's body um, and then here is just an image of actually a fruit fly that has green fluorescent protein expressed in the enocytes and this is just to depict where the enocytes are located um, and a similar pattern is found in honeybees so what occurs inside these cells is a variety of biosynthetic pathways that turn a single compound, acetyl-CoA, into a multitude of compounds um, that are found on the exterior of the insect. These compounds differ based on their length and on the connections between individual molecules in each compound. And so instead of a single compound being found on the exterior of the insect, it's actually a variety of compounds. And this mixture or combination of compounds is called a CHC profile. And I will be referring to CHC profiles quite a lot throughout this talk as well. So as I mentioned before, since CHCs are waxy, they actually originally evolved as an anti-desiccant mechanism in, across all insects um, to keep the insect from drying out. However, um, subsequent evolution led to many of these being co-opted as pheromones in many insect species. These uh, CHCs function as chemosensory cues that are sensed through smell or taste. So uh, some great examples come uh, from fruit flies bearing beetles and social insects. In fruit flies, um, different species have different CHC profiles and they actually use uh, these profiles to determine if another individual is a member of their species in terms of um, mating behaviors. In burying beetles, individuals have different CHC profiles and they actually use this to recognize their partners that they um, mate and raise uh, babies with. And finally, uh, social insects use CHCs in nest mate recognition behaviors. So, we know that CHC profiles are used in nest mate recognition, but how do members of a colony get a specific nest mate recognition cue? What defines differences in these CHC profiles between individuals from different colonies? Several hypotheses have been proposed. The first is that since all colony members of social insects are genetically related, that these CHC profiles would be determined genetically. So um, genetically determined cues would, would define these um, nest mate recognition cues. However, um, subsequent work has shown that while there is support that genetics contribute to CHC profiles, under natural settings, nest mate recognition cues are largely dependent upon an insect's environment, with possible uh, cue sources coming from nesting materials, such as wax, um, diet, or even interactions with the queen. And so overall, it seems unlikely that nest mate recognition cues are defined by genetics. So this led to the inception of a, of a different hypothesis, usually called the Gestalt model. Under this Gestalt model, colony specific cues are actually acquired by transferring and mixing CHCs between individuals. So every nest mate has a colony average. So under this model, individuals would produce their own CHCs, which will be deposited on their cuticle. And then through interactions with each other, um, these CHCs are mixed, um, usually through trophallaxis or just rubbing up against each other, so that there is an average colony gestalt, where every individual of the colony carries this average. And since different individuals are found in different colonies, different colonies would have different averages and therefore would have different nest mate recognition cues. Now this is largely supported by work done in ant species, which actually shows that these individuals are able to pass CHCs between themselves. However, in honeybees, um, something different seems to be happening. happening. So according to work um, done by me, which I will not really get into here, it seems that honeybees do not actually mix CHCs and transfer them. Rather, their CHC profiles develop 
in association with their behavioral maturation. So I'm sure as everyone here knows, uh, bees undergo behavioral maturation where they begin their life um, performing in hive behaviors and transition to um, foraging behaviors outside of the hive later in life. And so what I've found is that their CHC profiles differ depending on the age of the, of the honeybee and their behavioral state. Um, additionally, it seems that there's some kind of intrinsic process happening that it's not simply that honeybees are acquiring these uh, CHC profiles, they're actually producing them themselves. Furthermore, nestmate recognition cues in honeybees are known to be determined by the environment. Um, so for example, in this study from 1999, they raised, uh, two, they raised bees from two different colonies in a single colony and then they tested the acceptance of these bees at the entrance of the colony when these bees were about three weeks old. And what they found was that guard bees accept nest mates at high proportion whether or not they are actually related to them. And they accept non-nest mates at low proportion whether or not they are actually related to them. So overall this suggests that the environment masks genetics in terms of nest mate recognition cue. And so my, pre my previous data indicates that this effect likely occurs, that this environmental effect likely occurs at a specific time point in behavioral maturation. Um, but it's not, it, prior to this, it wasn't really known what environmental factor can actually affect the intrinsic processes of the honeybee to create a colony specific nestmate recognition cue. Um, and so this was the question driving this research. And so we thought about what could possibly act in this manner. Um, and we came up with possibly gut microbes. So gut microbes are actually known to influence recognition in many different organisms. For example, in spotted hyenas, uh, all members of their social groups have similar microbial communities in their anal glands. And what they use these for is they actually smear these microbial communities on different objects in their territory to um, mark their territory. Um, and these smears have certain smells that are then um, used to alert other individuals. Um, similarly, in the Indian mongoose, individuals have specific microbial communities in their anal glands, which they also use to mark territories. Now in both of these cases, it's the actual microbes themselves that produce the scents that are used um, in recognition behaviors. However, in insects, because they uh, rely mostly on pheromones, uh, such as cuticular hydrocarbons, uh, for uh, signaling each other, it's actually known that microbial communities in the gut can affect the cuticular hydrocarbon profiles found on the exterior of the insect. For example, in fruit flies, gut microbes are known to influence CHC profiles to um, which they use in mate preference. And in termites, um, gut microbial communities influence CHCs to influence the ability to recognize relatives. And so we wondered if gut microbes may actually be the defining factor um, to drive colony specific CHC profiles used in nestmate recognition in honeybees. Okay, so on to the hypothesis of the paper. So in the honeybee gut, there are 14 characteristic honeybee gut bacterial species. All of these species are found in, in every single honeybee um, across, so far as we know, across the world. Um, and uh, they are thought to have evolved within the honeybee. They are only known to live in the honeybee gut um, and they are thought to have a very close relationship with the honeybee. When the honeybee encloses as an adult um, from the pupil stage, they actually do not have a microbiome. They, however, by the time that they are four days old, 
their characteristic microbiota is established. And so subsequent research has shown that honeybees actually have to acquire their microbiome through interactions with other bees and hive materials such as wax. Um, if you keep a honeybee from enclosure in isolation, it will never develop a microbiome. And so it's because of these dynamics of how the microbiome is shared between members of the colony that we hypothesized that honeybee colonies would have colony specific microbial communities, meaning members of the same colony would have a similar microbial community um, in terms of abundance of specific species, but different colonies would have different microbial communities composed of different abundances of the individual species. Um, and that it would be these colony specific communities that would then drive colony specific nestmate recognition cues in honeybees. And so if our hypothesis is, our hypothesis is correct, then several predictions um, emerge. The first is that, well, colonies would have colony specific gut microbial communities. The second is that differences in gut microbial community would lead to differences in nestmate recognition cues. And on the flip side of, of the coin, similarities in gut microbial community uh, would lead to similarities in nestmate recognition cue. And we tested all of these predictions in our paper. So on to the data and results. So to test this first um, prediction, whether colonies have colony specific microbial communities, we performed um, gut microbiome sequencing. What we did was we actually sequenced this gene called the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. This gene is depicted here. Um, and if you look closely, you can see that in each of these colored parts is a gene sequence. So uh, you can see the ATCG nucleotides. And this gene is very highly conserved across all bacteria. The sequence is very similar across all bacterial species. However, this gene also has what are called hypervariable regions, which is kind of difficult to see here, but they're, they're bolded and they're labeled with V1 through V9. And these regions are variable, meaning that different species have a species specific sequence that is associated with them. And so what we can do is we can choose one of these variable regions and sequence it and use that to determine what species that gene came from. And so this is very useful when you're looking at complex microbiomes that are composed of many different species because you can just um, target a specific region, sequence it, and then you can figure out what species are in there and the abundance of each of those species. And so uh, what we end up with is a table that looks something like this, where we have the sample and then each of the different species that are found in that individual honeybee gut and the abundance of that species in the gut. And this is what is called multivariate data, meaning that multiple variables such as species are found within a single um, sample. And so we can plot this to look something like this, where each bar represents an individual gut and different colors represent the different species. Um, but as you can see here, it's kind of messy. You can't really tell differences between individuals from different colonies, for example. And so luckily there are various statistical techniques that can condense all of this information from one gut into a single point, which can then be plotted. And so that's what we use. So here, um, this is called a NMDS plot. And all you really have to know is that each point represents an individual B gut or an individual B. And uh, points that are closer together are more similar to each other in uh, gut microbial community than points that are further apart. And the coloration depends on which um, treatment the honeybee is in. So in this case, it's colonies. So what we're looking for are clusters of points based upon the treatment group. 
So here we have clusters of um, bees uh, that based upon which colony they came from, indicating that bees that are from the same colony have similar gut microbial communities. Um, now, in I'm going to be showing this type of slide quite a bit, uh, this type of um, plot quite a bit. And in all cases, I still, I have my uh, statistics listed here and bolded lowercase letters indicate statistically significantly different groups. So here you can see that, um, that it seems that uh, members from different colonies do have different gut microbial communities and therefore that colonies do have colony specific gut microbiomes. So this checks off our first prediction. Um, now to test the second prediction that differences in gut microbial community lead to differences in nest mate recognition cue, we hypothesized that sister bees uh, who have different gut microbial communities would, different, would develop different CHC profiles and different nest mate recognition cues. To test this, we performed um, a variety of lab microbiome manipulations where we took capped brood frames from, from hives and brought them into the lab. And as the bees emerged, we placed them into various treatments um, in the lab. This is an image of our treatment boxes that we use. And what we do is we place treatments into their food um, in the top of the treatment box. Um, and so we keep them in these boxes for about 16 to 20 days, and then we extract their CHCs and analyze them. So as I mentioned before, uh, CHC profiles are composed of many different compounds. Um, this is an example of one B CHC profile. Uh, on the x-axis, we have each of the different compounds that are found on that CHC profile. And on the y-axis, we have the amount in nanograms of that individual compound. So again, CHC data is also multivariate. And so we also use that NMDS plot, which I mentioned before, for microbiome data to look for differences between groups. So we performed three different types of treatment experiments, which I will explain as I go through them. So the first is antibiotic. We treated sister bees with either antibiotics or gave them a sugar control group and uh, saw if it changed their CHC profile. And what we found is that indeed it did. Disruption of the gut microbial community does alter CHC profiles. So here you can see that, um, that bees that were inoculated or that were treated with antibiotics developed a different CHC profile from those that were treated um, just with sugar water. Next, I wish to assess whether natural differences in microbiome can cause differences in CHC profile. To do this, I took advantage of the fact that bees acquire microbiome from interactions with older bees and reasoned that young sister bees interacting with older bees from two different colonies would acquire different microbiomes and thus would also develop different CHC profiles. Now here um, is just an indication that these sister bees did in fact develop different microbiomes. Um, and this is the case for all of the treatments that we're showing today. I'm only showing it here, um, but just know that every single one of my treatments did in fact cause the bees being compared to have different microbiomes. Now, did this affect their CHC profile? That's the important part. And in fact, it did. So when, when sister bees were inoculated by older bees from two different hives, they did develop different CHC profiles, as you can see here. However, when these older bees were first treated with antibiotics to wipe out their microbiome, uh, the sister bees that were inoculated by them did not dif differ in their CHC profile, indicating that it is really the microbiome that is defining the CHC profile in these bees. Finally, I wish to perform more controlled inoculations to cause specific changes in the gut microbiome between individual bees 
such as inoculations with individual species of bacteria. Luckily, um, I'm able to culture two different honeybee associated microbes um, just on st using standard uh, culturing techniques in the lab. So this is actually a bacterial plate that I got after I just took a honeybee gut and I smeared it on a plate. You can see that individual colonies of bacteria grew where these uh, bigger white colonies are a species called Giliomella apicola and these uh, clear-ish smaller colonies are a species called Lonsdalia quercina. Um, so I can pick those individual colonies which are um, which individual colonies of bacteria are composed of genetically identif identical um, clones. And then I can culture those in a liquid and then feed it to the bees. Um, now, something interesting, however, to know is that these two bacteria have different relationships with the honeybee host. Giliomella apicola is, uh, a, is one of those uh, stable members of the honeybee microbiome. It is a honeybee symbiont. It evolved to live inside the honeybee and has a special relationship with the honeybee. It does specific functions for the honeybee um, and cannot live outside of the honeybee. Lonsdalia quercina, on the other hand, is just an environmental associate. So it actually mostly lives in trees, um, but it is often associated and found in honeybee guts. However, it can live outside of the honeybee and it has no known function for helping the honeybees. So it, it is um, just an associate of honeybees. And so I can use these two different bacteria to induce these specific inoculations in honeybees. And what I find is that when I do these, it does indeed lead to differences in CHC profile between sister bees that were inoculated with one or the other of these microbes. So in addition to uh, looking at CHC profiles, however, I also wanted to actually measure recognition behaviors. And I did this through uh, in-lab assays. So in order to do these assays, I made artificial colonies of three bees who live together in a Petri dish for a few days. I then add an intruder bee and I watch how the group of three bees responds to her. If they leave her alone or treat her as a nest mate, then that is considered acceptance. If they bite, sting, or attack her, that is considered rejection. So uh, in, the, in, this case, in this experiment, the group of three bees were um, all treated with either Giliomella apicola or Lonsdalia quercina. And then the intruder bee that was introduced was inoculated with either the same microbe or a different microbe. And so overall, we have four different comparisons. And so what I found was um, that bees inoculated with Giliomella apicola can distinguish bees inoculated with the same species of bacteria versus those inoculated with a different species. So uh, when the group of bees is treated with Giliomella apicola, they accept Giliomella apicola bees at high proportion and Lonsdalia quercina bees at low proportion. And these are statistically significant, different. And so overall, this suggests that the effects the microbiome has on the CHC profile can indeed affect recognition behaviors, as we would expect. However, there's something interesting that's happening here because this, and this was something that I was not expecting, that when the bees, the group of bees were inoculated with Lonsdalia quercina, they were unable to distinguish uh, intruder bees that were inoculated with the same microbe or a different microbe. So it seems that in addition to the effects that the microbiome has on the production of recognition cues, the microbiome may actually also affect the ability to perceive recognition cues, linking cue production and perception. And this effect seems to really be dependent on the relationship that the bacteria has with the honeybee host. For example, microbes that typically always live in honeybees that can only live in honeybees and that are symbionts with honeybees have this effect, whereas those that do not, do not have this effect. 
And so all of that data together indicates that when sister bees are inoculated with different microbiomes, they do indeed uh, develop different CHC profiles and recognition cues. So finally, to test uh, this final prediction that similarities in microbial community lead to similarities in nest recognition cue, we reasoned that unrelated bees treated with the same microbiome would develop similar CHC profiles and recognition cues. And indeed, this is what we found. So what I'm showing here are bees from two different colonies, colony one and colony two, uh, who were inoculated with either Giliomella apicola or Lonsdalia corsina. So color corresponds to what microbe they were treated with and shape uh, indicates what colony they were originally from. So what you can see here is that clustering occurs largely based upon what color or what microbe they were inoculated with, indicating that inoculation with this microbe leads to similarities in CHC profile. Similarly, when I perform those in-lab behavioral assays, I found that when colony one bees were inoculated with Giliomella apicola, they accepted other bees from both colony one and colony two that were inoculated with Giliomella apicola at high proportion and accepted colony one and colony two bees that were treated with Lonsdalia quercina at low proportion, indicating that um, having a similar microbiome leads to you being accepted by guards that have the same microbiome. So, so far I've shown you evidence that gut microbial communities influence recognition cues in honeybees. However, this isn't the end of the story. There's one more part of the story, and that is determining what levels of microbiome diversity contribute to defining colony-specific nestmate recognition cues in honeybees. So far, what I've shown you is that uh, cue, nestmate recognition cues can be defined by the community of microbes in the gut, depending on the abundance of each of those species. So for example, uh, bees in this colony might have a low proportion of this red species, while in this one, they might have a high proportion of this red species. Um, but Microbial community diversity is not only defined by the abundance of individual species, but also by the abundance of different strains, so below the species level. So this led us to wonder, what about strain level differences in gut bacteria between honeybees? So a strain is a genetic variant of bacteria, virus, or other microbe. And, they and different strains typically have slightly different functions and in interactions with their hosts due to these genetic differences. For example, uh, different strains of uh, influenza have different genetic, are different genetic variants and therefore affect you in different ways. That's why you have to get your flu shot every single year um, due to a different strain of the flu virus. And so we were wondering if this would be the case in defining nestmate recognition cues in honeybees. So to test this, we first wanted to know if different colonies of honeybees have different strains of uh, individual microbes. And in spe in, uh, specifically, we looked at Giliomella apicola since we were able to easily culture this in the lab. Now, this is going to get a little confusing because I'm, because a uh, colony can refer to bacteria and honeybees. So if from this point forward, I'm going to try to refer to honeybee colonies as hives and um, bacterial colonies as colonies. Um, so what we did was we compared uh, strain level diversity of Giliomella apicola uh, from four different bacterial colonies per bee across four bees per hive across four hive for a total of 64 bacterial colonies. And to assess this diversity, we used um, something that is called single nucleotide polymorphism frequencies, or SNP frequency. So 
a SNP is a single change in sequence. So as you can see here, uh, this cartoon depicts the same gene. You can tell because the, the sequence is very similar between them, but it differs between um, copies based upon one nucleotide. This is called a SNP. So uh, what I did was I sequenced a single gene across all 64 colonies of bacteria, and I counted the number of, of SNPs in the sequence between them. And then I looked at different comparisons to determine different levels of um, SNP diversity. And so what I found was that when you look within an individual, the proportion of SNPs in the entire gene is really low. That is expected. Um, so this really means that within an individual B, all of the Giliomella apicola cells in their guts are basically genetic clones. When we look at bees that live within the same hive, they have a higher proportion of SNPs in this specific gene, indicating higher genetic diversity, but it is still relatively low, indicating that members of the same honeybee colony have genetically similar strains of Giliomella apicola. Finally, when we look at bees from different hives, uh, they have a high proportion of SNPs, indicating a high level of genetic diversity in bacterial strains, indicating that honeybee hives likely have different strains of bacteria in their gut or more genetically distant strains of bacteria in their gut. Um, so while this suggests that this is present in the guts of honeybees, is this sufficient to actually cause differences in nestmate recognition cue between individuals from different hives. So to test this, I actually took, uh, I actually treated sister bees with four of the more, most distantly related Giliomella apicola strains that I had. And I saw if they developed different CHC profiles. And not surprising, they did. They did develop different CHC profiles. Um, so here, this is a little misleading um, because the best way to view this data is actually in three dimensions, um, but I'm not able to make a three-dimensional three plot that looks very good. Um, but you can just trust me that these are different um, CHC profiles based upon what strain of bacteria these bees were treated with. Um, so overall, this suggests that strain level microbe diversity can contribute to host CHC diversity. But what about actual recognition behaviors? What I found was that when I performed these in-lab behavioral recognition assays, that the group of bees accepted intruders that were inoculated with the same uh, Giliomella apicola strain as them at high proportion and accepted those from that were treated with a different Giliomella apicola strain at low proportion suggesting that strain level microbe diversity can contribute to recognition behaviors. So overall, what I've shown you today is that colonies of honeybees do in fact have colony specific gut microbial communities and that this composition is, uh, and that these differences are due to differences in the abundance of individual species, as well as strain level diversity. Furthermore, I've shown you that differences or similarities in gut microbial community lead to differences or similarities um, in recognition cue, and that the gut microbiome could actually be a link between cue production and perception in the honeybee. So our working model is currently that as when bees emerge from the comb, they lack a microbiome. They acquire this microbiome through contact with other bees and hive materials. And these microbial communities then affect the function of cells in the abdomen that produce pheromones or CHCs, um, ultimately affecting CHC profiles, which are used as nestmate recognition cues. Furthermore, some of my data indicates that microbial communities can also have effects on the brain of the insect to influence the bee's ability to recognize nestmates and intruders. And combining this with my previous work, 
This likely occurs at a specific point in the behavioral maturation of the honeybee. Okay, so now I'm very briefly just going to touch upon some of the stuff that I'm currently doing in the Robinson lab as my, or for my postdoctoral research. So uh, what I'm currently studying is actually the role of microbiome in the onset of foraging behaviors in the honeybee. The work that I just showed you largely looks at the effect of microbiome on cells in the gut that produce pheromones. However, behavior is largely controlled by the brain. So I wanted to know if microbes can actually influence the brain of honeybees. And this is something um, that I'm doing through looking at foraging behaviors since many of the um, changes that occur between nursing, between in hive behaviors and foraging behaviors occur in the brain to cause that type of um, behavioral switch. I've already found that two bacteria seem to be associated with this change. And I am planning to do a variety of experiments where I treat bees with these specific microbes, and then I perform behavioral assays and then also perform um, genome and RNA sequencing to look at the effects that they have on honeybee cells in the, in the abdomen as well as in the brain. Um, and eventually I'm hoping to actually be able to produce um, genetic mutants of these bacterial strains to actually functionally test what genes in the microbe are affecting behaviors in the honeybee. Um, okay, and so finally, um, some acknowledgements. Uh, the work that I presented today was um, all work that I did as a graduate student in the, in the Ben Shahar lab, uh, pictured here. Um, and it was uh, work that I did with collaborators, Joel Levine, Joshua Krupp, Gautam Dantas, and Boema Adu Apong. And um, my, funding or my funding came from the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. So thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Cassandra. That was great. Um, we have some questions, of course. Um, and uh, some of them are a bit too technical for me, I'm afraid. I'm just a, a chemist. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not very good on the, the, the biology side. But there are some from a practical beekeeping point of view um, with a focus on uniting colonies, which is something that beekeepers obviously have to do from time to time. Um, will there be a treatment we can use to unite colonies directly without, for instance, using newspaper? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. That is something that I have been asked before, but I don't know. So what I can tell you is that based upon my studies, if you wipe out the honeybee microbiome, it makes it way easier to put groups of bees together. So theoretically, you could treat them with antibiotics, which I don't suggest because the <laughs> microbiome is also very important for many of the other things that I mentioned, like digestion, nutrition, just their behavior in general. Um, so theoretically, that could be a method that you could do to join colonies, but I wouldn't suggest it. No, uh, antibiotics in the UK are definitely frowned upon. They're, they're not not allowed for uh, AFB at okay. all, and uh, for EFB only in exceptional circumstances. So, um, yeah. It, Unfortunately, uh, they are highly used in the Americas, um, both in North America and in South America. So yeah. it's a big problem for us here. Yes, no, we, we have a very low incidence of American fowl brood. Um, possibly due to the policy of destruction every time <laughs> yeah um well one of the reason one of the things i was wondering about are are these um chc profiles consistent over time over a season for example and or, or and from year to year do you, do you know anything about that yeah so uh what i can tell you is that they are not so they do change depending on the season um, because CHCs are also influenced by UV exposure. So you can imagine that during months when there's a lot of sunlight, um, that would also change CHCs. But the main thing to know is that individuals within a colony seem to have 
a similar CHC profile. And even if that entire colony's CHC profile changes over time, um, it, they're still able to recognize nestmates from non-nestmates. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that's actually been shown when you split colonies, that there seems to be some kind of divergence in CHC profiles that occurs after a certain amount of time. Yes. Is that because they're foraging differently in the environment? Well, I, that I could be the case, yes. Um, I, I did I wonder think... whether when you get into monoculture, uh, whether the biomes stay similar. Uh, so, so the my so it's kind of thought that the what the honeybees forage on doesn't play, have that big of an effect on the microbiome. It certainly has some effect, but it's it doesn't seem to be that big of an effect. What seems to be more of a driving effect of the microbiome is just this separation and then uh, lack of contact between colonies and just like just dynamics of being separated for a certain amount of time that causes just, you know, evolutionary changes in your microbiome or just ecological changes. Right. Um, I have a question here from Charlie. Uh, he said, <clears throat> it, it has been said that foreign bees, those from other hives, can enter a hive if they have stores of nectar and pollen. Is this still true or do the CHC replace this thinking? Okay, so I think he is referring to robbing behaviors. So that is a, a, uh, a common phenomenon in honeybees. Uh, and that is thought to be one of the reasons why social insects have evolved the ability to recognize nestmates from non-nestmates. So this is really something that depends on the actual guarding force of a colony. If you have a weak colony, you don't have as many guards actually being able to detect intruders from nestmates. Um, so what, what is used in that case is CHCs. And it's also thought that as robbing occurs, the more and more incoming bees from the second, from the invading colony, um, the guards at the entrance of the original colony kind of get used to their CHC profile and no longer recognize them right. as um, non-nestmates. So overall, it seems that um, nestmate recognition is a very complex behavior that's defined by many different factors. And uh, in the case of um, the perception side, not a, not a lot is known. So what happens in the honeybee brain to actually allow them to recognize intruders from nestmates is not really known. I think maybe he uh, something I've heard is that a, a bee that has pol has stores with it um, may may get knocked about a bit, but then admitted. Whereas something that that, that hasn't got those stores is that hasn't got the, the ticket to get in as it were <laughs> yes okay yes yeah. no that is something that i think um also goes into those dynamics of nestmate recognition in general that i think that having that having pollen or you know spitting uh nectar into a guard's mouth kind of overrides the the uh intruder like response from the guard right. um so that's another um interesting aspect of honeybee biology that's yeah. not really understood. David asks a similar question, how does this theoretical work account for colony merging and acceptance or new queen acceptance? So, uh, so uh, theoretically, um, if you can somehow induce uh, bees to have a similar microbiome, which would lead them to develop different, to develop similar CHC profiles, then it could play a role in colony merging. Um, however, what I think actually happens during colony merging is some kind of uh, shared in environment that causes similarities in microbiome. And certainly, as I mentioned before, nestmate recognition is a very dynamic and complex behavior. So there are other factors that play a role. Um, but overall, I think at this point in time, we don't really know what goes into the ability to merge colonies. Right. Um, 
You've mentioned sister bees on several occasions, but not half sister. Can bees recognize members of the... Oh, um, I think he's... Uh, do patrilines come into this at all? Um, okay, so this is a question because uh, previous research has shown that bees can recognize different patrilines, but it seems that at the entrance of the colony in terms of nest mate recognition itself, that this does not seem to play that big of a role. So I think that um, there, there is research that indicates that they can determine um, Petra lines and that they may do some discriminatory behaviors within the hive, um, but it seems to be the case that in terms of just lighting bees in the entrance of the colony that it does not seem to be that big of a deal if you are of the same patrol line as the guard or not. Heather asks <coughs> or says nurse bees will be feeding larvae before emerging and one might suppose the hive signature would start earlier than the four days I think you mentioned. Yeah so what happens during the pupation phase of honeybees is that there's a total restructuring of the honeybee body and it's basically they be they restructure their gut so they lose all of their microbes in their gut um, and then basically they come out as a clean slate when they close from the pupil stage. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. There's there's a number of other questions there. There's some quite technical ones which I don't know whether you can see. <laughs> there's um, uh, but um, uh, let me see what else have we got. I can read. I can answer this OTU question. So I did not use OTUs. I use ASVs which I can't remember what the A stands for, but sequence variance, um, which is basically just uh, differences based in one nucleotide between reads. Um, and okay. certainly metagenomic data can get at the, the um, overall functions of bacteria, but I think that you can still get the same level of, um, of of species, at least the species level diverse or diversity, it is difficult to get down to strain level diversity, which is why I had to do something different when I was looking at strain level differences. Right, thank you, Cassie. I've got one more question I'm going to put to you, and then I'll let you go. Okay. Um, oh, it just moved. It, it's about glyphosate, and and it says um, if glyphosate perturbs the gut microbiome, would exposure lead to nest mate recognition problems or would the hive be adapting to the changing cues? What sort of effect would you expect? That is a great question. I would expect that the hive would have some adaptation. Um, I think the data, so the data about the glyphosate is coming from Nancy Moran's group and I think that it didn't totally wipe out the microbiome. So, that, so in that case, it could just lead to um, similarities of microbiome between colonies that live in the same area that are exposed that are having exposure to glyphosate in that case it might make recognition behaviors between those colonies more difficult um, but I do think that honeybees are pretty resilient and that guardian behavior like I said several times before is very dynamic and complex and that they can kind of relearn a new colony signature hmm. <clears throat> would um, would colonies where the recognition was high? Um, how can I put this? I wonder if it if it come, if it plays into the defensiveness of a colony. You know whether colonies are not on guard, as it were, not <clears throat> not um, happy with their lot, and you know happy when a beekeeper starts messing around with them, and not too upset and versus you know if they're forever having to fight off neighboring colonies uh, perhaps become more aggressive um, yeah, yeah. yeah. so that is actually something that is currently being studied in the lab that i'm currently in is the effect of constant exposure to um, threats and the effects that it has on the physiology in the brain and that actually induces bees to be 
when they have to be more protective, it causes them to automatically like be more hmm. protective, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, yes, I was they become about more <laughs> aggressive over time. I was wondering about that um, uh, monoculture have, producing similar biomes and recognition, therefore being less precise, and therefore they'd be more aggressive. But um, but you say possibly. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that though. That could be the case. Yeah. Anyway, well, thank you very, very much. Uh, a fascinating subject, one that we've not covered before, I don't think, and it just goes to show that these things, um, you know, they're never as simple as we think, and uh, the practical implications, you know, we do, we do suffer from um, the effects that are going on here. So uh, thank you once again, Cassie. That's a wonderful talk. And, um, thank you for inviting me. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And so 